You know, a lot of people go around in kind of a daze trying to figure out what's actually happening in these days. Well, research makes it clear we are in chaos. And there are seven indicators that we're going to look at just to tell us how bad the chaos is today on the Bucky Kennedy Podcast. I read an article uh, it came from Prophecy News Watch. It's written by Michael Schneider. And the article says seven numbers that clearly reveal the direction that America has chosen. So it's not a mystery. I mean, it's not a perception. It's not an opinionated deal. But as a believer, these numbers, this research, this data gives me a clear indication as to not only why the chaos is what it is, but why it's so intense, why it's gaining ground. Because there are so many things that are happening uh, right now that tell us, hey, we're on the, the verge of a societal breakdown. And again, that's not hyperbole. Uh, and as I get into this, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about a little bit. So let's kind of start looking at these seven indicators. Uh, the first one that is listed here is there's more political chaos in our nation than there has ever been in our entire lifetime. And more than 40% of U.S. voters actually believe that a second civil war is likely within the next five years. Now, that's more than four in 10 U.S. voters say the country is likely to get ripped apart in a second civil war within five years. That's 41% I a civil conflict compared to 49% who say it's not likely, another 10% said they are. That's 106 million U.S. adults who say we are headed toward a world, uh, toward a civil war. Now, I want you to think about that uh, as we move forward. So how does that even exist? I talk a lot about propaganda. I talk a lot about narratives. Well, there was a release called The, uh, the American Civil War. I think it was a movie called that. It was a number one box office hit here recently in the summer. Hollywood's in on the game, and so they're they're already pushing this narrative. And other show, it doesn't really matter whether Trump becomes president or Biden becomes president. It won't have an indication as to a civil war. They believe that no matter who gets elected, we are headed toward a civil war. Now, whether that's going to happen in the next five years or if we even make it the next five years or beyond that, but what we need to understand is is there's already a messaging going out there. There's already a narrative being set in place, hey, that America can be at civil war. Now, we used to promote nothing but unity. We used to promote patriotism. We used to vote Americans for America. But we're not seeing that right now. And so uh, this survey comes against uh, all of the violence that we're seeing right now in the U.S. on college campuses, uh, the pro-Palestinian protesters that are happening. So... It's something's ramping up. Violence is certainly ramping up. Division is becoming more intense and deeper. So uh, this first indicator that all of us see it, that the United States of America is more like the divided states of America, is no longer just something that, you know, pundits in the news media can talk about. It really is coming into fruition. The second thing, according to a recent Gallup poll, is only 30%, 36% of Americans approve of Israel's military campaign in Gaza. Again, talk about propaganda. Everything is moving toward. Israel is a sovereign country. It's, it's their own entity. They have a right to defend themselves. And they are under attack. And why they have to justify themselves. Think about this. Uh, Russia is attacking Israel the Ukraine, and we're giving billions and billions of dollars, and it, we don't have a problem with Ukraine trying to defend itself against Russia. Well, it's in our greatest interest, more so than even Ukraine, that we would ally ourselves with Israel. And most people don't understand what Israel is going through, their existence, and it's just the same playbook, this anti-Semitism that's on the rise, this saying that we need to stop doing this and tell Israel to stop. There needs to be a ceasefire. There needs to be a two-state solution. Well, first off, 
The Palestinians would never agree to a two-state solution because they want Israel totally gone. They preach and yell and stand for genocide. And I've said this before. If uh, this were the Ku Klux Klan saying, death to all dark-skinned people, we'd be up in arms about it. If this was someone shouting, homosexuals must die, the LGBTQ people must be eliminated, we would be enraged about it. But this is something that is not new to the Jewish people. We saw it in Germany. We've seen it throughout history. So I just tell you, most people are saying this, one, because they don't understand the conflict, and certainly because they don't understand the Bible. So the next indicator we're going to look at is that 65% of Americans do not approve of the Supreme Court decision that overturned Roe versus Wade. 65%, let me say it again, 65% of Americans do not approve the Supreme Court decision that overturned Roe versus Wade. Those who strongly disapprove of the decision continue to outnumber those who strongly approve by more than two to one margin. Again, and I'm going to say this a couple times here. Uh, for all of 2020 and most of 2021, we were told, trust the science, believe the science. But science doesn't matter. Biology doesn't matter when it comes to protecting life. We know that life begins at conception. It has been medically proven. It has been biologically proven, scientifically backed. We know that. Matter of fact, if a pregnant woman were to be murdered today, it would be a double homicide. So what we're really saying here, most of Americans want this option. And part of this goes to the fact that we no longer value life. And I've said this all along. When we no longer value life in the womb, we don't care who goes to the tomb. So it's all about valuing life. And, and I, and, evangelicals are slow to speak to this because it's a hot topic to them. They call it a divisive topic. It's a biblical topic that life matters. And I'll just say this. Every woman has a choice in this matter. And it's the choice that starts with not having sex outside of marriage. If you don't want children, don't have sex. And don't make children a consequence of a passionate decision. It's not that. Children are a blessing from God. They are his blessing to us. So uh, it's just another indicator when we say, hey, why is America doing this? Listen, because we're butchering, we're killing innocent lives, innocent children. Uh, so as we move on, the uh, second thing that we're going to look at, the fourth thing is more than 20% of Generation Z adults, uh, that's adults ranging from 18 to 26, uh, now identify as LGBTQ+. That's 22% of the population of Gen Z now say that they identify as LBGTQ+. That's a lot to keep remembering there. Now, this is just a social construct but it is taking root in our society. So how do I know this? Well, uh, when you start talking about previous generations, uh, the percentage drops. For instance, less than 5% of Gen X uh, identifies that way. Less than 2% of baby boomers and barely 1% of what they call the silent generation identifies that. So why are we seeing this uptick? Because we've promoted it. We've protected it. We've made it clean and clear. And so we see this taking place. Now, when you start talking about the ramifications about this, because we hear people say, well, if they want to do that, that's fine. That's not what's happening. Tax dollars are going to work at not only promoting it, but making sure the procedures are available for those that are experiencing this dysphoria. Now, the number they don't ever want you to hear is that 85% of those that make the transition as children or teenagers, they detransition, 85% detransition. And the suicide rate actually goes up as a result of the transition. It doesn't go down, and it has nothing to do with acceptance. 
it has everything to do that a child may think, hey, listen, I think I want to be a girl. He, is a, he or she is in no position to make a sex change. They are not having dysphoria. They are children growing up. And parents need to be parents and understand this. Uh, I was reading the other day about parents whose child uh, is what they call a furry. The child thinks that she's a cat. Well, I'm going to say something. That's ridiculous. It's a biological impossibility. It just can't happen. But I'm going to say if, if they're going to start identifying that, and if there's an emergency, then take the child to a vet. Now, some of you say, well, that's kind of harsh, Bucky. Well, they're identifying that, and guess what? The vet won't take them because the veterinarian will say, I can't treat, this is a human. You see how insane this is becoming? We are just reaching insanity when we're kept telling, trust the science. Well, biology is clear. There are two genders, male and female. It's not anything else. Because I identify something doesn't make me something. When I was a little boy, uh, I wanted to identify as Superman. So we had this little house behind uh, our house, this little shed. And so I tied a towel around my neck, which was my Superman cape. I got on that, the, the, on that little roof, which is about probably eight foot off the ground, and said, I'm Superman. I jumped, and guess what? I did not fly. I convinced myself I was Superman. I convinced myself that I could fly. But the reality of gravity set in and told me it really hurts to try to be something you're not. So I just would put that out there to you and just say, hey, listen, we've created this construct, and it's causing a national security issue because according to the Daily Mail, the number of transgender groups, troops in the U.S. Army has doubled since 2020. See where it started? 2020. This is where this nonsense started to come forward. So the Pentagon, listen, the Pentagon has spent more than $26 million treating transgender troops since 2020. That's official records. $26 million. The number of U.S. Army staff with gender dysphoria has doubled in that time from around 1,800 to 3,700, according to Department of Defense data. And we need to understand that in the past Three years, $17.5 million in taxpayer money was spent on psychotherapy for trans service people, and $1.5 million went towards hormone drugs. We're not buying bullets. We're not. We're helping men become women or women who think they're men become men. And it's a national... If you've got somebody that's needing psychotherapy, do you really want to give them powerful weapons and turn them loose? Think about this. This is the insanity we're facing. Another 7.6 million funded gender-affirming surgeries, including facial tweaks. This is the military to make recruits more masculine or feminine and the removal or creation of breasts and genitals. Man, I'm just saying there's so many things that I could say right now about this. But can I just say this is insanity. It's insanity that we actually have a doubling of people in this that have what used to be called in the in just in the very close past was a psychological, a mental health issue. Are we going to trust them to be? Loyal to the to the United States of America, that they're going to be patriots. They're not even loyal to their own identity, much less the United States of America. And yet we're letting them transition. We're giving them psychotherapy. And then we're telling them to go protect America. I don't feel protected. I don't feel like there's a, a secure military that's watching over our best interests while the wolf's at the door. No, the wolf's no longer at the door. The wolf's in the house. In the Pentagon, that's where the wolf is. Number six, by a vote of 692 to 51, the United Methodist Church has voted approval to LGBTQ clergy and same-sex weddings in their churches. That's right. The United Methodist Church, one of the largest Protestant denominations in the United States, has voted to repeal its ban on LGBTQ clergy as well as prohibitions on its ministers from officiating at same-sex 
weddings. Now, let me just say this. The reason they won this is because the United Methodist Church has lost thousands of churches. So those who would oppose this move moved out, basically clearing the path for the United Methodist Church to make this decision. And I'm going to say this. The United Methodist Church, they were in a coffin. They just put the nail in it. This is heresy. It is unbiblical. It is ungodly. And just because they passed the vote 692 to 51 doesn't change what the Bible says. You see, heaven is a theocracy. It's not a democracy. God doesn't rule by numbers. He rules by nature. And his nature is holy. Yes, he is loving, but he is holy. When we get around the throne of heaven, we're not going to sing loving, loving, loving. We're going to see and hear the angels sing holy, holy, holy. Again, that doesn't make him less loving. It does say that he is holy, he is just, he is right, and he is good, and he is long-suffering. And I pray that the Methodist Church will repent of this nonsense, this nonsense. And I just say this, as someone who grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, don't think we're not far behind them because the Southern Baptist Church right now is still engaged in some nonsense. And we're arguing over the petty and forgetting the principles of what the Southern Baptist Convention was based on. We used to be based on the inerrancy of Scripture, the evangelizing of the nations, educating men and women into the ministry so that they can serve according to the calling of God. But right now, on all three of those levels, the Southern Baptist Convention is on shaky grounds. It's lacking the clarity and the conviction that it once had the courage to say, the Bible is exclusive, the Bible has authority, and Jesus is exclusive. There is no other way to come to, to salvation other than Jesus Christ. And when that becomes negotiable, when the exclusivity of Christ and the authority and the inerrancy of Scripture get questioned, you aren't on a slippery slope, you're in a death spiral. So in the last thing we're going to look at, the seventh indicator is only 3.6 million babies were born in the U.S. last year. We're not replacing ourselves. We need a birth rate of at least 2.1. Right now, the birth rate is 1.6. So what's the big deal? How big a change is that? Well, in 1960, uh, women gave birth to 3.65 children during their lifetime. Today, that number has fallen to 1.6. It is the lowest ever recorded number. The lowest ever. We're not replacing ourselves. Now, you can offer a lot of things like that. One, we're talking a lot about same-sex marriages. Well, they can't reproduce. Same-sex people can't reproduce. Now, there's artificial insemination for the lesbian culture, and that baby can, that lady can have a baby. But men with men can't. And even if you have this trans surgery, and you you're a man, and you become a woman, you don't get a uterus. I'm just sorry. They're, they're, again, this is basic biology. Basic biology. If you're in a class day, and I realize all of these analogies uh, are subject to change in a culture that's always changing and living in delusion and deception. But if you teach math and your student comes in and 2 plus 2 equals 4, but they put 5, 6, 7, 8, whatever, anything but 4, I haven't met a math teacher yet that wouldn't count that as wrong. So what we're saying is, though there are absolute truths to math, biology says the same thing. No matter what you feel, no matter what you think, you are either a man or a woman biologically. That's what you are. It is an absolute truth of science and biology that men are made men, women are women. And so... Feeling differently doesn't change what we were created to be. And having an identity crisis doesn't solve the dysphoria that you're feeling. A matter of fact, as a young child, you'll grow through that dysphoria. And let me just say this. We can talk about the generational problem, but how did this generation get to where they are? There was a parenting problem. When parents were worried more about becoming their child's friend than becoming their child's parent, the authority, the, 
that discipler that they needed in their life. So we have all of these issues, a declining birth rate. All of these things are, are playing together for our culture. Now, as someone who preaches the gospel, can I tell you what I feel like? I feel like Noah. Noah, for 120 years, did exactly what God told him to do. He was faithful. He was righteous. He was obedient, not only in building the ark, but proclaiming that wrath was coming, but there was safety in the ark. And the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 25 that when we start looking at it, it says that for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. But in verse 39, it says, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. Everybody's going to understand clearly God's agenda, but for many people, it's going to be too late. So I just want to encourage you today, if you're out there preaching, understand this, you're not alone. But I often think this way. Here's Noah. Noah is building this ark. Now, people ridiculed him. They questioned him. It's never rained before. He's building this ark in the middle of nowhere on dry land. And for 120 years, he's telling people, the wrath of God's going to come. He's going to flood the earth. This ark is your safe haven. Get in it. The door's only going to be open for a short time. Get in. You don't have to go through the wrath. There's a way of escape. And they just went on about their work. They went on doing whatever they want to do, mocking, ridiculing, and saying, Noah's lost his mind. But can you imagine the thought process when the animals started loading up? I mean, listen, obviously, if you see a deer walking in front of a lion, yesterday that deer was a meal for the lion. Today they're walking peacefully into this ark together. All of these animals walking in, they are just know that this is what God has called them to, two by two. You would think that people would look at that and say, maybe we ought to get in the boat. They didn't. They didn't. Because they just thought it made no sense that Noah had lost his mind, that he'd gone crazy. And they didn't understand it until the flood came. Don't wait. Today, call on Jesus Christ. Let him be Savior of your life. Come to Jesus today. God bless you and thank you for being with us. Follow us at BuckyKennedyMinistries.org, Instagram, Facebook. Until next time, keep looking up. Jesus is coming. For more content like today's podcast, click right here. For sermons, click right here. And again, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Have a blessed day.